Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, Revenge on a Thief. TLDR, friend of mine stole my bong and bragged about it to Johnny, stole Johnny's pot plants and bragged about it to me. Everyone got their stuff back and he lost all of his friends from it. So this all occurred when I was 18 years old, I was a pretty immature person at that time in my life, and I'm writing this from my perspective at this age. At this point, I would have handled the situation differently. But had I done that, it wouldn't have ended so satisfactorily. This is a story about a bong I had stolen from me. At the time I didn't have a lot of money and I had spent close to $300 on it. I lived with my grandparents and they didn't mind me smoking but did not want me to do it in the house. The house was very old, and had an attached decaying barn where I stored said bong in a hidden room. The house and barn were absolutely massive and there were a lot of hidden rooms and areas that you really had to look for to find. I frequently had my cousin, we'll call him Corey, and a mutual friend, Ray over to hang out in the barn, smoke, do whatever. Ray has a reputation as a kleptomaniac, and was three years younger than me. I had known him for a few years at this point, and any trust I had for him was stupid and misplaced, because I knew what kind of kid he was. One night, around midnight, I was with Corey in the barn when he had to leave and go home. We said our goodbyes and I remained in the barn until maybe 2 a.m. before going inside. As I left the barn and was on my way to the front door, it suddenly started torrentially down pouring out of nowhere, no longer than maybe 30 seconds. This is important to remember, I get up the next morning to find my bong had been stolen. Now the only three people who knew of the location of it were myself, Corey, and Ray. Corey had an alibi as he went home with to his family and was there the whole night after he left the barn. Between that and Ray's history, it was obvious who had done it, but that didn't help me as he was a minor and I knew he would deny it if confronted. So I call Corey, explain, and he comes over to help me come up with a plan. We knew a few locations where Ray used to stash his stolen items, so after thoroughly checking his safe spots, we opted to go talk to him. Now I'm trying to play it smart, because I want my things back, along with the bong was my first ever piece, a small pipe that had the bowl head itself caved in and had a metal bowl head inserted in order to make it usable. It was a piece of junk but I didn't have much and it was given to me by a close friend. We entered the house, started talking as we normally would, and I casually mentioned that my bong had gone missing, to which Ray replied, or oh man that really sucks. Well, I have something that might cheer you up, and proceeded to bring us to a trail where he presented three pot plants to us. We knew he hadn't been growing these, so I asked him where he got them. I stole them last night, he promptly replied, proud of what he had accomplished. As the discussion went on, he said he and a friend had walked three miles up the road to take them, walking them all the way through town right on the main road, somehow not being caught. He also mentioned a brief rainstorm that absolutely soaked them while they were transporting these plants. So now I know he's out stealing that night, and I had a time frame as to when he was out doing this, indicated by the rainstorm. But this still wasn't enough and I still had no chance of convincing him to return it. So Corey and I took matters into our own hands. The next night, Corey and I went out and stole the three plants. I'm not as brazen a person as Ray, so it took some coordination in order to move them to where we needed them without being right on the main road a mile from the police station. But we managed it, and hid them in yet another hidden room in the barn that Ray was unaware of. My plan was to call him on stealing the bong and use the plants as leverage, knowing he would value them far more than the bong. The next morning however, opportunity struck. I woke up and walked outside to find a cop parked at the end of the trail where the plants had been hidden. Now I knew the cop was there to watch speeders, as this was a well-known area people got caught speeding, but Ray didn't need to know that. I called Ray and Corey to meet at Ray's house, telling Ray to stay away from the trail as the cops had found the plants. At Ray's house we spent a good couple hours discussing the situation, Ray still not knowing I was onto him or that I had actually taken possession of the plants. A new guy, came running in the house, we'll call him Ed. Ed approached Ray and tells him, Johnny's outside waiting in the car, he knows you took his plants and he's upset. Ray is visibly disturbed by this and immediately leaves, telling us he'll be right back. 
Corey tells me he knows this new guy, Johnny, I guess he was a local dealer and had quite a reputation around town. After waiting a while and looking around, unable to find the bong, I decide I'm not sitting here and I leave. On my walk home, a car pulls up next to me. Johnny's in the driver's seat, Ed in the passenger seat, and Ray in the back. Start talking to Johnny, and he asks if I know where his plants are. Opting to try and get more info, I tell him no, but ask if I could catch a ride. During the tense ride back, I mentioned my bong had been stolen a few days ago too. Johnny immediately replies, without hesitation, yeah that was this kid, pointing at Ray, he was bragging about it to me the other day. Well now the cat's out of the bag and it seems I've lost my opportunity to get more information discreetly. After a quick argument, I get dropped off at my house, and the other three go their own way. Now I didn't hold my tongue about the plants because I wanted to keep them. To me, they were a hassle and I only wanted my bong back. So after waiting a few hours to ensure Ray was not with them anymore, I got Johnny's number from Corey and gave him a call, telling him I had his plants and was going to give them to him, all I needed was to know what he knew about my bong. Ten minutes later Johnny and Ed arrived with Corey, and I gave Johnny his plants. After loading up the plants into his car, Johnny said to me, since you got my stuff back to me, let me make a call, and see what I can do for you. We all watched as Johnny called Ray, who was unaware that he had his plants back, witching him out over stealing his plants once again. We both know you took my plants, and we both know you took that guy's bong, and I've got nothing in my hands now because you lost them to the cops, so now I want that bong. 15 minutes later Johnny arrived with my bong, we shook hands, and never saw each other again. Months later, while out working, I got a call from Ray. Things hadn't been going well for him, as he had lost all his friends over this event. He told me he was sorry for stealing my bong, and he was working and wanted to make it right by giving me the $300 I spent on it since he didn't know I had it back. I didn't end up taking the money, as that phone call was satisfaction enough. The next one is titled, Pink Karen on Ski tries to intentionally cause an accident and goes insane, so I make her lose part of her equipment. This happened roughly two years ago. Background info, I grew up in the mountains, was four years old when I first attempted skiing. At 11 I started snowboarding. I love both of those sports and have spent a lot of time practicing. I am not telling you this to brag, but I feel like I should clarify that I know exactly what I am doing, even though I do go fast. It all happened on a beautiful sunny morning. It had snowed the night before, roughly 60 centimeters 25 inches fresh snow. Amazing powdery snow. Naturally, I got up early with two friends to go off piste. All three of us were on snowboards. Ski lifts were already running, so there were some people on the slopes. We went off piste a few times with no issues whatsoever. But of course we had to get back on the slope system at some point to reach the station at the bottom of the lift to go back up again. This is where I encountered the Karen. We were still in the deep snow. The slope we wanted to get on was long, flat and rather narrow. Due to the fresh snow and also a height difference that always is there, we had to jump down roughly 1.5 meters 60 inches to get on the piste. No big deal, especially because the snow was so soft that even if I fell I likely wouldn't get hurt. My friends went first, jumped down and crossed the piste to go off piste again to take a faster and steeper way to the lift. I waited until both of them were already in the deep snow to make sure I wouldn't hurt them if anything went wrong. Then I checked if anybody else was near. And after seeing I had more than enough space, I jumped. And then I heard a scream. I thought an accident had happened. I'm a goofy, right foot in the front, so I was able to see downhill, where no accident had happened. I knew my two male friends off piste couldn't have screamed so high pitched. Therefore I did a sharp turn also slowing down a lot, allowing me to look uphill to see if someone needed help. Instead of an accident I saw a woman in a pink onesie yelling like a banshee and skiing towards me really fast. You know how some people go way faster than they can handle? She was obviously one of them. She held her sticks so that they were almost parallel to the ground. She had her legs really far apart, which I guess helped her as her ski wiggled so hard they would have hit each other and made her fall if she had her legs like any normal person on ski. I was a bit amazed at her not having fallen yet and very confused at what was even happening. 
After I had gotten over the initial shock of a manic Teletubby attacking me, I figured she was going to hit me if I didn't get out of her way fast. However I had slowed down because of the screen, and my front leg was facing a wall of snow. Only thing I could think of was making a small jump to gain speed and get my front foot downhill to make another turn and safe myself into the deep snow. I was almost at the edge of the deep snow when I noticed she had changed her direction so that she would have hit me if I had still tried to go down there. I stopped as hard as I could. She still fell for some reason even though definitely I didn't hit her. I just covered her in a fair amount of snow, because that's just what happens when you break hard in powdery snow. I also ended up sitting on my buttocks, because I had put a lot of force in stopping and because I attempted to duck while braking because I saw her stick almost hitting me. It still hit my head, but luckily I was wearing a helmet so not much damage done. After that I just sat there, because ya know, I was a bit shocked. The Karen was laying a few meters down the piste and was still yelling. But I still heard my friend calling for me, asking if I was okay. I told him I was but had to handle something real quick. One of the advantages of a snowboard is that you can get up immediately after you fell, unless you are injured obviously. With ski it's different. Once you fall, you are tangled between ski, sticks and limbs. For some reason both ski of the Karen still were on her feet, bad idea for someone who is obviously a beginner. Thinking she just had lost control and didn't have any bad intentions, I went to help and check on her. As I was approaching her, she hit me with her stick. Luckily it just went against my boot so it didn't hurt, but I definitely didn't want to get near her after that. I didn't just want to leave either just in case she was injured, so I awkwardly kneeled in safe distance waiting for her to get up. Some of you may have noticed that her kid hasn't made an appearance yet. That's because the kid was much more sane than his mother. He just drove as fast as he could while still being in control. Which is great, I wish more people were like that. However he then slowly approached me and his mother, crying because she had left him alone. The Karen, who at this point had sorted her limbs to a point of sitting normally, the way you do when you get up after a fall, yelled at him to shut up, which of course made him cry even more. Then, the following dialogue ensued, with the poor kid constantly crying in the background, Karen, it's all because of you. You almost killed my son. Me, excuse me, what are you talking about? Karen, you are ducking insane, you jumped down from there and you almost jumped on my son. Me, you were all the way up there, if I hadn't stopped because of your scream I wouldn't even be on the piste anymore. Karen, no, it's all your fault, you ducking snowboarder. Goes on a rant on how awful and ruthless all snowboarders are, me, yeah, whatever. I'll leave you alone then. Karen, no, you stay here, idiot. Me, no, you're incredibly rude and I don't. Karen, shut the duck up and give me your ski pass, you don't deserve it, give it to my son. I decide this is pointless and get up to go to my friends by going down the piste a few meters to gain speed and then going off in the deep snow. However that didn't quite work. I was barely up as I feel something hitting my side causing me to fall, mainly from shock I guess. Turns out she had thrown her stick at me. Me, what the duck? Karen, continues to scream about me having to give her my pass. Fortunately I was finally at the edge of the piste, so I just crawled the last meter, turned so that my board was in the deep snow and rode off. It was pretty steep where I went down, so I knew she couldn't follow me. And the best part? I didn't feel like returning the stick she threw at me, so I just took it with me for a few meters and left it in the middle of the mountainside. The stick still was there several days later. The next one is titled, customer witched me out for not wanting to reopen my department to make her a pizza, so I wasted her time. Edit, friendly reminder, this is petty revenge, not AITA. Whether or not I am a dick for this isn't really what I'm looking for her. I got petty revenge against a customer who was treating me poorly. If you don't like that though. I really don't care if my work ethic at a minimum wage part-time job is coming under question here. This is a really dumb one, but it was satisfying so why not share it? I'm a university student working a supermarket job that's just slightly above minimum wage. It's a nice enough job, and the managers and colleagues are friendly, so I don't mind doing it. The customers are a mixed bag though. Every single week without fail, this old woman comes in and asks for four gluten-free pizzas with triple mushroom and triple bacon. 
She always arrives super late into the shift, normally when we are running out of ingredients, are about to close, and it's usually hit or miss whether we have gluten-free bases in store, and you had better believe she blames me when this happens. I don't mind making large orders, but it's pretty inconvenient especially when she comes so late in the evening. Worst still, she always has an attitude and is overall a nightmare to deal with. I've always worked with the rule that if a customer is polite and nice to me, I will return the favor and be nice back. This might mean I give them extra toppings, or I'll work on the presentation a little more for them. Normally it just means I'll be friendlier to them. Similarly, if a customer is being a cunt, I will put the bare minimum effort into whatever task I am doing for them. I finish at the same time every week 8 p.m. Today, at about 7.15 I was closing my department. Had already covered the pizza ingredients, put away the utensils etc. Midway through cleaning, the Omega Witch rolls up to the counter. I apologize and explain that I'm closing down and finish at 8 p.m. She immediately starts complaining that she has been told we are open until 9 p.m. I tell her that the store is open until 9, but the pizza department closes at 8 p.m. at the latest. And as I am only working until that time, I have to close everything down an hour earlier. She gets even angrier and walks off, before returning maybe 5 seconds later after the thought of a sad, pizza-less night flashes through her tiny brain, and she tells me something along the lines of, no, you have enough time. Stop cleaning and make me my pizzas, you don't close until you've done that. I argued back a little but she was getting irritable and as much as I like arguing with witchy customers, I don't want to get in crap with my managers. So I just look at her and say, I'll go to the freezer and see if we have any gluten-free bases. So I dip out to the warehouse, knowing full well that we have bases, and just chill there for 10 minutes or so. Catch up with the warehouse team, check my phone, you know the rest. When I feel like enough time has passed, I head back and she's still waiting there. With the most deadpan voice I can muster I just said, we don't have any of the bases. The look of anger and defeat that flashed across her face was so damn satisfying. She kinda just threw her hands up before leaving, and I got back to finishing cleaning up. The thing is, I don't mind making late orders for customers. It's super inconvenient and making a late pizza means I have to re-sanitize the surfaces, re-clean the utensils etc, but if somebody is polite to me I respect the urge for a late night pizza. If a customer's gonna be a dick though, there's no way in hell I'm gonna make that pizza. I will go out of my way to make sure they can't have it. Hope you enjoyed hearing about this. If anything else like this happens I'll share it here. The last one is titled, An Interesting Call, Led to a Private Investigator. This story begins almost a year ago. I received a call from an unknown number on my cell phone. It was an automated message to call an 888 number in regards to serving me papers. I knew right away this may have been a collection agency. Googled the number and confirmed it. Now I have to disclose I did have identity theft almost 20 years ago. To this day, I occasionally get calls from collection agencies trying to collect on some debt from 20 plus years ago that was cleared. Now most of the time when I get these calls, I ask for their address to send in a dispute letter including the accompanying data for proof that I had identity theft. Granted, they should not be calling me, but they apologize and I don't get another call. Plus, they usually mail me back and said they closed the account. Well, I go to call this person and I got to say the call was interesting. This woman answered and I gave her my information. She started rattling off a debt that was back in 1995. I let her finish and I told her that I had no knowledge and there was identity theft. And as soon as I said that, she freaked out. She kept saying she knew the debt was mine and I'm going to pay. I kept telling her that I wanted to mail a letter. But she flat out refused. When I told her I knew my rights, she said that I had the right to pay the debt. She then said that she is going to put a lien on my huge pretty house, her words, and she was describing the house to the letter. She also said she is going to put a lien on my Lexus that she sees in the driveway. And she said that my gate in the front won't stop the repossession. She then hung up. Now, I knew better. All she did was get my info from public records and then saw my house on Google Street View. My guess is that she tried to push this intimidation on other people that know better. So far it appeared to be a very disreputable company. 
I also had phone recordings when I called in. And they were legal as I asked her if phone calls can be recorded for quality control purposes. She said of course. And I said, thank you, I'll take that as my consent. I would have just let this go and just say this lady was crazy. But I kept getting the automated phone calls and I couldn't block them as they were unknown. I googled the company and I thought they were in Ohio. There were a couple of flags that led me to believe this was that the person who owned this company in Ohio was being indicted with charges as an attorney. I placed a complaint with the Ohio Attorney General. They couldn't find any information on what I was submitting. They did call the phone number I gave them and the Attorney General told me they would stop from calling me. But that is all the Attorney General could do. I also complained to the Federal Consumer Finance Bureau who is supposed to be looking into these issues. But they blew me off. Well, three months later, I called this number. I had an idea of maybe pressing buttons when I called in to see if I could get more information about the company through the interactive voice response. Well, that paid off. As soon as I pressed zero, I got a different company name. I googled that company and got tons of complaints. This led me to the company existing in NY. I complained to the Attorney General of NY with all of my new info. I did quite a bit of research over the next couple of weeks and found out a whole bunch of information, like the owner's name. I found out that the address where the company no longer received mail was at the owner's address, their Facebook account, etc. I then got another one of those unknown phone calls. But this time, it's a different company. I'm sure you get what I am getting at, the company just keeps changing the name, but the parent company still calls. I finally had enough of this. I get a private investigator involved and they were quite satisfied with all the information I had so far. So I let him do his business. Well, he calls me back saying that this company isn't even registered and it's run by this one lady. I find out that the rude lady who I was talking to is the supposed owner, but not running a legitimate business. I got a process server to file a claim in NY. Granted, I think I could have done it where I was at. But I was heading up to that area in NY anyway as I had some family reasonably close. The problem was she was not able to be served. The house which she owned, she was not able to be served at. Either she was not there or was staying somewhere else. Well, my private investigator started sending out friend requests to her and the people in her friends lists. Her friends and then she accepted the Facebook request. My private investigator found out that she cheated on her boyfriend about a month ago since she posted that crap. The private investigator gave me an idea of trying to reach her boyfriend and if he can lead us to serve her, I will give him $500. We did that and sure enough, we were finally able to serve this lady at her parents house about 20 miles from where she was at. I fly up to NY and since it's small claims, it's just me and this lady. For some reason, her mother is there too, but she is not representing. I give the judge all of my info I had over the months and how she broke the law. She broke debt collection laws and made threats over the phone. After the judge heard all the trouble I had with these calls and how she hid her identity purposely, the judge gave me the maximum amount of $3,000. In NY, small towns and villages are limited to $3,000. After the case, I heard her mother loudly whispering, but I heard it, you better hope he doesn't take your house. Your great-grandfather built this with his own bare hands. I was thinking, hmm, it would be sweet revenge if I could actually put a lien on the house. Well lo and behold, I found out the house had a second mortgage attached to it. With the property value of the house and if it sold, I wouldn't end up getting the lien money since the secondary mortgage was almost as much as the house. I was then contemplating how I was going to get the money from this lady. My private investigator calls me five months later and said her house is going into foreclosure. I get a proxy to bid for me. But as in most foreclosure actions, the bank buys it back as in Rio. I decided to send in a low ball offer to buy the house a couple of months later. The bank accepted my offer. My guess is that it's a small town and trying to get the right market was an issue. You may be wondering why I even bought this house. Well here's why. This dumb bunny threatened to put a lien on my house with no merit. Well, guess what, I took her house. It was completely worth it. It didn't cost me too much and I had the money. 
The house is actually in decent shape, just a little small. Plus it will be a nice summer home when I go to visit my relatives. Oh, and I decided to rub in salt to the wound. I sent a letter to her parents address letting them know I took the house. I told them that if their daughter wouldn't be in the business of scamming people, they may not have lost the house. I also go to find out that the Attorney General of NY is now investigating this lady. I hope they throw the book at her. Not going to mention the collection agency, but if you stopped getting phone calls from them, you're welcome. Thanks for listening.